This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Good morning. I'm Joanna Albala. I'm the manager of the science education program at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. And I'm so thrilled that you've all come out to see Science on Saturday, which is brought to you in partnership with the Livermore Valley Joint Unified School District. I hope that you enjoyed our sneak peek into the laboratory that you got to see. And um, before we get started with the presentation, I have some housekeeping rules for you. So first of all, in case of an emergency, please note the exit signs around the theater. And if we need them, our ushers will escort us out to the front of the building safely. Secondly, please silence your cell phones so we can give our presenters their full attention. And finally, at the end, we'll have a question and answer session. And if you don't get your question answered, feel free to come up to the apron of the stage at the end of the show and speak with the scientists directly. So this year's theme is Women in STEM, Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. And we kicked off last week with science. And we talked about the city's favorite element, Livermorium. Well, today we're going to talk about technology and how the lab is developing bioprinting and biochips to understand the human body. So to help us today, we have Ms. Erin McKay, who is a teacher at, in, of biology at Tracy High School. And she's going to work with our scientists and engineers who are led by Dr. Elizabeth Wheeler, who's a chemical engineer at the laboratory. And she leads an exciting team of scientists and engineers. And I would now like to present them to you. Welcome. Good morning, and thank you for coming out to join us today. So as jo Joanna mentioned, we're going to talk to you about building human physiology on a chip or something that fits in the palm of your hand. So this is part of the iChip team. iChip stands for In Vitro Chip-Based Human Investigational Platform, which is quite a mouthful, which is why we call it the iChip. So we have a large team back at the lab working on this project, but there are five of us here today who are going to tag team and tell you a little bit about our, what we do. So starting over here on my left, we have Chris Culp. She is a lead biologist, went to UC Davis. She's a pharmacologist and a toxicology major. Uh, next to her, we have Heather Enright, who is a biologist and a chemist who also went to UC Davis. On my other side, we have Sarah Felix, who is a mechanical engineer from Boston and then went to UC Berkeley. And then directly next to me, Monica Moya is a bioengineer combining the biology and the engineering and went to the Illinois Institute of Technology. As Joanna mentioned, I'm a chemical engineer. I went to Stanford, but of course, more importantly, I went to Livermore High School, so go Cowboys. Yeah. All right. So what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about, the, about our project, iChip. What exactly does it mean, and how do we use it? Most importantly is why do we even want to study human physiology? So we're going to talk about that. We're then going to talk into the engineering that goes into the device. How do we make a human on, a, on something we can hold in our hand? We're then going to talk about the different systems we've already designed. We're really focusing on the brain. So we're going to talk about the blood-brain barrier and then the nervous system, both the central and the peripheral nervous system. And then at the end, we're going to tell you where we think this technology is going with bioprinting, kind of the path forward. So what I'm going to do now is we're going to hand it off to Chris, and she's going to tell you about why we would even want to study the human body. So Elizabeth poses the question of why do we want to study the human body? I think a better question is why not? We are arguably the most complex biological organisms on the planet, and we desperately need to know about ourselves. Two of the things that we are most interested in is what makes us sick, and then if we get sick, what makes us well again? For example, as we walk through our daily lives, we are exposed to a myriad of different kinds of substances. There's chemicals in our food, in our water, and even in the air that we breathe. And in order to understand whether these substance are, substances are having a positive or a negative effect on our biology, we have to acquire data. We have to do tests in a way that's relevant to our human organism. And this is really tricky. And then if we get sick, we need to have a medication that will make us well again. And so we want to have 
a specific chemical that will write that wrong biology and not cause any other effects in our body. And this is very, very tricky. When people are developing new drugs, it can take 15 years or more to get to the, the new drug all the way through the process of identification, testing, approvals, and this process can cost, cost $15 billion or more. As I said, it's a very tricky business. And even when we do get a new drug approved for use in humans, often there's a side effect that we didn't anticipate that pops up and causes people to get sick and then dooms that drug to failure. So why do these new drugs that we're developing have these side effects that we can't predict? Well, basically, there are a lot of reasons. But one of the prime ones is that we can't do the right testing in the right people. And we can't do enough of the right testing in the right people. We're all very different. So in this slide, the, our human population is represented by different colors. And so we're going to give this human population the same drug. And we're going to get different effects. So in the yellow people, whoops, I didn't move it, sorry. <laughs> in the yellow people, um, the drug we give them fixes what's wrong with them. It's efficacious, but, and it doesn't cause any side effects, so it does exactly the right thing. We're bang on, good for us. In the gold people, the drug doesn't work, but it doesn't cause any side effects, so it's basically useless, and there's no point in even giving those people that drug. In the blue people, the drug might, doesn't work, but worse than that, it, doesn't, it makes them sicker than they were when they started. So it has an unanticipated side effect. And if we have any of those kind of effects in our new drug, we have to take that drug off the market because we can't identify which are the blue pop people in our population of people. So it's doomed to failure. So we have a really hard problem to solve here. And what do we do? Well, frequently what biologists do is they use animal models. They, use, they start with rats, and then they use dogs or primates. But you know, and I know, that animals and humans are not the same. And so that the data that we get from our, human model, our animal models often is not relevant, and sometimes it can even take us down the wrong path. So what we really need to do is have a system where we can test our drugs or chemicals on human tissues or human relevant tissues that, in, that are arranged in such a way that gives us data that we need. So what we want to do is we want to miniaturize some human systems, connect them, and arrange them and get that good data. What we want to do basically is build a human in a box. But as you can imagine, there are a lot of challenges to building a human in a box. For the first thing, we have to get the engineering right. We want to build our box such that the, hum the human cells and tissues that we put in it are kept happy and healthy and that they are functioning correctly. And this is a big challenge. And then secondly, once we get that engineering right and our cells are happy and functioning, we want to be able to test the cell's reaction when we put a, a new drug or a chemical on them. And we want to be able to do that in real time. So we need good me measurements of our cells. And thirdly, we need to do this in three dimensions. So biologists often use two-dimensional flat plates of cells to do their tests. But that really doesn't give us all the information that we need. We are 3D, and we would like our system to be 3D as well. And that is a big challenge. But let's imagine that we have our human, system, we have our human replica, our system, our human in a box, and it's all working exactly right. What could we do with it if we have it functioning? Well, what if there's a new virus that pops up, like the Zika virus that you've seen in the news? We could add that Zika virus to our human in a box, and we could use that system to develop new drugs or vaccines and not have to do human testing with that virus. And I also talked about the fact that we can't do enough testing to understand how drugs are going to work on individuals. Well, what if we could use this for personalized medicine? If we could take out stem cells from a particular individual and see them into our human in a box and make that make a basically a mini you or a micro you, then we could pretest the drugs or chemicals on that particular person and get person specific information about whether those new drugs are going to work or whether they're going to cause unanticipated side effects. 
And finally, what we are really interested in, you can do some really cool brain research. We can understand how our neurons are interconnected, how they function, and also how exposures to those drugs and chemicals affect their function. So what does our system need to have in it? Well, the best system would have representation of all of our major organ systems. And the ones that are on the slide are the ones that are most commonly identified as being critical for a human in a box. We also want to interconnect these drugs, these systems, so that we can bring the uh, nutrients and other things that the cells need to the cells and take away the waste and other things that they don't need away from them, kind of like our arteries and our veins. But what we realized was, as a team, we can't function, we can't focus on all those different systems. It's just too big of a problem. So what we are focusing on is the nervous system, the blood-brain barrier, the peripheral nervous system, and the central nervous system, which is what my colleagues are going to talk to you about during the, the talk. But first, Elizabeth is going to come out, and she's going to describe microfluidics and how we can interconnect our systems using small amounts of fluids. Yes. So as Chris mentioned, we have these different systems that we need to connect together. If you think about it, your body is connected by blood flowing continuously. So we need these fluidic interconnections. So how do we do this? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to leverage microfluidics. So microfluidics is basically like it sounds. You take small amounts of fluid. You're going from a large swimming pool to just drops of liquid. Take these small amounts of fluid. You can move them around. The advantage of the small volumes is they react very quickly, so you can do tests quickly. You can also lower the cost when you have smaller volumes that you're looking for. Now, if you've ever had blood work drawn, you know that they take a large vial of blood. It always seems a large amount. Imagine if you could just take a, take, have a finger prick and take a drop of blood and do all the analysis that you could do in a big lab with that one drop of blood. Think of the cost savings, the time savings, as well as just the pain of getting the blood drawn. So this is called lab on a chip, where you can reduce all of these technologies into something about this size, about the size of what would fit into the palm of your hand. So this is actually our blood-brain barrier microfluidic chip, which I'll talk about after I explain on about the microfluidics. Now, you can do a lab on a chip, so why not take the human and, again, take it down to a chip size features and fit it on a piece of glass. Now, when I'm talking about these small features, they're about 100 microns. To put that in perspective, that's about the width of one of your hairs. So this is the size of the channels, the pipes, essentially, that we're going to be pumping our liquid through. So because these are such small channels, we want to make sure we don't accidentally get any dust or dirt or human hair on our devices, because that would really hinder the blood flow. So if you look up here, we have some pictures of some colleagues of ours in the clean room, which is a facility out at Lawrence Livermore Lab, where they can go ahead and make these devices with high precision and high cleanliness. Now, how do we go about making these microfluidic chips? Well, we have to define the features that we're looking for. So what we're going to do is we're going to leverage some technology that was published by a different group a few years ago, Jello Fluidics, to really demonstrate what we mean by, by these microfluidics. We're looking at jello fluidics. But it's analogous to what we do, actually, in the clean room to make these devices. First of all, we have to define our features. So on the left top up here, we see this is our negative mask. This is the inverse of what we want to see on the chip. So you can imagine on the right, this is our plate. We've taped down our popsicle sticks to make it so that we do not get any polymer or jello where we don't want it to be. So we then add our polymer. We put it in our device, and we let it set. So the polymer we're using here is simply jello and gelatin. So that we pour it on, it, it fills the plate, covers, covering the features that we're, we're, we're uh, defining. We then go ahead and really carefully peel off the device, whether it's a polymer or jello. This is very critical that we keep those channels intact. And you can see in the lower right-hand image the, de the definition of the channels that we're looking for. So now we have this, you know, we, can have, we have our jello and it can wiggle. But we need to bond it to something so we can really put fluid and liquid through them. So we bond it to the surface of interest that we're looking for. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask Erin, the, uh, the teacher, to come out and help us demonstrate how fluid flows in these tiny features. So this is our Jello fluidics demonstration. OK, guys, so we have two different dyes here. We have red dye and we have blue dye. Now, when we mix these together, what color do we expect to make? Yeah, purple. 
But if things go well, we should actually be able to put in the red dye into one channel and the blue dye into the other channel. And if we flow it through at the same rate and it hits the center point at the same time, instead of mixing together, they will flow side by side. But I only have one shot at it. Let's see whether we can get it to work or not. So Kaylee's gonna help me here. We've got red on the left, right? And blue on the right. Okay. So go ahead and set our thing. So she's gonna take the tubing and poke it right in. Okay, are we perpendicular and good to go? Mm -hmm. Okay, fingers crossed, here we go. Uh-oh, red's getting ahead. Let me catch it with the blue. And I see an air bubble. Oh, oh, here we go. There we go. So you can see I had the blue coming in a little bit more than the red. Now, to make sure we can see it um, in its full detail and its full glory, we'll go back to Elizabeth who has a beautiful video of it perfectly running. <laughs> It's always a challenge doing a live demo. You never know exactly how it's going to turn out, but that turned out pretty well. So we're going to recap and watch the video up here. We're going to be seeing the same thing. So we introduced the fluids, and you would expect that they would mix, but this is actually laminar flow. This is a unique feature of the microfluidics. What happens is the fluids don't mix. So they flow down, uh, down the channel in the proportions of the flow rates that you're putting them in. So what we saw a little bit in the demo was the blue, there was more blue dye coming in, it was coming in faster, so the proportion, the amount of blue in that channel was larger than in the red. But this is actually a design uh, that is used to keep, in batteries, for example, to keep anodes and cathodes separate. So taking advantage of this non-mixing can have some key advantages. So this is, thank you. So this is uh, our gelofluidics, which is analogous to our microfluidics, but it's a lot easier to see than just looking at this microfluidic chip up here. But how do we bring this back into the iChip, the human investigational platform? Well, if you think about it, the blood is flowing through the pipes and the tubes in your body all the time. So let's go ahead and think about putting the blood-brain barrier onto a microfluidic chip. What does the blood-brain barrier do? Well, it basically it protects the brain. It serves to, to filter anything uh, from going, any chemicals from going across the brain and interfering with the neurons in the central nervous system. So it's, if we very simplify the device, on the right-hand side here, it's a tube. It's a capillary, it's a tube. We have cells that are on the inside of this tube, the endothelial cells, and we have astrocytes on the outside of the cell. And it's very important we have these human cells so that they can communicate and really control which chemicals are allowed to have access to your brain and which are not. So if we introduce the fluid that we have here, for example, the red blood cells and some of the chemicals, the blood-brain barrier, by communication of those cells and by controlling what gets across, some of the chemicals, for example, the small chemicals, the small molecules in this case, will make it across the barrier, which is important if you're looking at certain pharma, uh, uh, pharmaceuticals, and some will not. So this blood-brain barrier is very critical that we have this permeability aspect to it. So how do we put this on our device? Well, we take, this, this is an image, it's about one and a half centimeters in length, so probably about the width of your thumb. And we flow liquid in from the left, and it comes out through the right. Now, remember, we have to have this area where some of the chemicals can get across. So this center region here is where some of those chemicals can cross the barrier. Now, we seed our cells on the inside of this. So this is an image of the endothelial cells that are on the inside of this tube. What you'll notice is that these cells, they are touching each other. There are these tight connections, these tight junctions that really control and protect your brain. On the outside of the tube, we have our human astrocytes. These are the cells that are on the outside and then can reach into the brain and for the communication. So putting both of these on this one fluidic device, so we'll, I'll say is no small challenge. We're really integrating the engineering and the biology. But what we end up with is a nice uh, cell that has these a nice, uh, sorry, a nice cylinder that has these cells all over the outside as well as the inside. So now we can really introduce those chemicals and start studying and, under and understanding how the blood-brain barrier works. Now, as I said, the blood-brain barrier protects your nervous system. So what we're now gonna do is I'm gonna have Heather come out and she's gonna introduce you to the nervous systems and how all this ties together. Okay, thanks, Elizabeth. So let's talk about your nervous system. So within your nervous system, you have two parts, your central nervous system and your peripheral nervous system. So Sarah will talk about your central nervous system, which has your brain and spinal cord, but I will focus on the peripheral nervous system. And these are the nerves that extend to your extremities. So you use these nerves really for your, all of your senses, 
um, to move your arms. Everyone can move their arms. That's communication from your peripheral nervous system to your brain. Okay? And so within your peripheral nervous system, you have these nerves that extend to your periphery for sensing. And on these cells in your nerves, neurons, you have these receptors. Okay, so these receptors are then stimulated, and that electrical signal is transmitted to your brain. So if you stub your toe, when you stub your toe, that electrical signal is transferred to your brain, and you say, ouch, why did I do that? So let's talk about what those neurons are actually doing. So here's an example, or here's a schematic of a neuron. Uh, in the middle there, you have your cell body. Inside of that is your nucleus. Then you have these little branch-like structures on the outside of your cell body called dendrites. Now, there are receptors on these dendrites, and chemicals stimulate these receptors. And upon stimulation, then you have electrical current that transmits down the cell. So we can actually look at this. So you can see the yellow arrow in the lightning bolts. That's electrical current that's um, transmitting down your cell, down the axon to your axon terminal. And so that signal uh, transfers from cell to cell, and that's how your cells communicate with each other and communicate what you're feeling, what you're seeing. Um, involuntary movements, like your heart rate and also your breathing is transmitted this way. And so you need all this to function. So Erin will actually show this in a, in a demo. This is a signal propagation demo with some of her students. Okay, so I have here a Tesla coil, and we are going to simulate a neuron. So Tesla coil, can't see anything's going on. You might hear from my mic a little bit of sound. So first of all, Misty's going to come a little bit over here so she's away from everybody else. We're just going to demonstrate the fundamentals. So we take household electricity and we're going to make a lot of spark, but in a very safe way. Because do you have a pacemaker? No. no, she doesn't have a pacemaker. Okay, here we go. Hopefully we don't put the camera out like we did on the first show. Okay, so that's the basics. So now we're going to make a student neuron. So go ahead, hold hands tightly. We don't want any... Sparks jumping between you. Okay, we all tight, nice and tight. So we have our dendrite, our cell body, and between Brandon and Alexis, our axon. We will know if we are collect, uh, conducting an electrical signal if the fluorescent light bulb glows for us. Let's take a look. I'll do it from here first. And then, so there we go, a student neuron. Thank you, Aaron. Okay, so this is a picture of our PNS device. So on the top left, um, nope, there it is. The top left picture there, you can see how small it is. So this is the size of about, of about a penny. And we can customize our arrays to make them as big and small as we like them. Um, within this array, so where that well is, this is actually where we seed our cells. So in that little well, we have this tiny little array. We have 16 electrodes within our PNS device. These are made out of platinum, and those pick up that electrical signal, those action potentials, or what's called an action potential. So that's uh, cell signaling, right, that those, those, these electrodes are picking up. Um, so on that right picture there, that's showing our 16 electrodes, and each one of those little dots is an electrode. Now, as I mentioned, we have receptors on our cells in our peripheral nervous system. And so we can actually validate our device by using microfluidics with a microfluidic cap. So on the bottom left picture is that fluidic cap. And we can flow in chemicals to stimulate our cells with those receptors to get an idea of what types of receptors we have on those neurons. So chemicals like capsaicin, which is in your food, right? So we can use that to stimulate our cells, and that's a, a model of pain, right? So what we can feel for pain. So when you do stub your toe or bump your elbow, um, that's one of those receptors that are being stimulated. Okay, and then this is our picture of our neuron again. So how are we actually collecting the signal? So our neurons, if you look at the bottom there, that's our electrode side view. That's the actual surface of our device. And each one of those black squares is an electrode. So when your cell fires and you have that electrical signal transmitting down your axon, we collect what's called an extracellular recording or an action potential. Okay, so that's that shape that you see in the bottom right-hand corner. So your cell is naturally at a resting potential, right? So when it's stimulated, you have sodium ions that flow in. That makes your cell more positive, okay? That's called um, depolarization. That's the rise in that peak that you see in that graph. 
um, as your cell becomes, uh, go, or returns down to resting state or repolarizes, you have potassium ions that flow out, which some of you may be familiar with. Um, that's the, the rise, or the, sorry, the fall in that peak um, within your extracellular recording. So then we can record these using our array and get an idea of how many cells we're looking at, um, who's responding to a particular chemical, and then do analyses on that data afterwards. So here's an example of the type of data that we collect. So in that image there, you can see that our responses are less than two seconds. So that's really fast, right? And you need to do that in order to respond. Um, what you're looking at here is the voltage that we're seeing um, after stimulation for our cells. So that white line across, that's just the, the background noise. Any spike, white spike, that's um, plus or minus on the top or bottom of that is an actual signal. That's an actual potential. And these are human cells that we stimulated with our device. So if you zoom in on a couple of those spikes, you can start seeing that they have a distinct shape. And if you zoom in a little further, there you see that classic action potential or response, right? So you have the, the rise and the fall and the peak. And so we can look at human cells with this, as Chris mentioned, which is really important, because then we can tell how you're going to respond to something or what kind of um, characterization of your cells um, we can characterize your cells and look at responses to different treatments. And then also, not only can we record electrical signals with our device, we can also look at them with a microscope. So we can use specific dyes. In this case, this is a calcium dye, which is looking at uh, changes in calcium within your cells upon stimulation. Um, on that left picture there, neurons are indicated with a yellow arrow. These are also human cells. Um, you have your electrode array, so that's the black behind those cells. And in between those cells, you have cells that are called glia. Now, these are support cells that are needed for your neurons to function in your peripheral nervous system. And I'm going to show you a quick video. So this is an example of us flowing in a chemical. We're stimulating those receptors on the cells, and you can see everyone lights up. So then we can use imaging on our microscope to see which cells are responding, and we can actually quantitate how much they're responding to each chemical using this technology. Okay, so I've spoken about the peripheral nervous system. Now Sarah's gonna come out and talk to you about what we're doing with the brain and how cool our device is. So Sarah? Thank you. All right, thanks Heather. Um, yeah, so the brain. Um, the, the brain, is, along with the spinal cord, is part of the central nervous system. And it's an incredibly complex organ made up of many different parts, many kinds of cells. Uh, just for example, the cortex on the outer, outer layer of the brain does all sorts of things, including processing sensory information like vision and hearing, and it also controls our muscles and our movement. Um, also, the, the hippocampus is another part of the brain that's involved with memory and emotions, um, among other things. Um, there's also the, the thalamus that is involved with um, sleep and consciousness. And the basal ganglia help, helps out with movement and coordination. And many other uh, sections of the brain. And they don't just do their own job. They also communicate with each other and coordinate. So wow, this is really complicated. How can we hope to capture this or model it on a chip? Um, well. Uh, Chris kind of talked about the same question in introducing the whole human in a box or human on a chip. It's a very complicated, many organ systems that we might want to include in the future. Um, maybe you guys will be working on that someday. But for now, our first step is to take a subset, a few different subsystems, and uh, that we have an understanding about how they work together and put that on the chip. So similarly, with the brain, we have a device where we could take a few different types of cells from different regions of the brain and put them onto our platform. And it's a similar device to what Heather was describing. You'll see it's uh, kind of different shape and size. But this is the layout of the device, and it's kind of neat because um, if you look at the, the shape, it's kind of this Mercedes pattern in the middle with a ring around the outside. We can put four different cell types and um, if you look at it, every individual cell type is able to contact the other three cell types. So here's um, a look at the actual device. 
So on the top right is the electrode array. So different from the peripheral nervous system, it was a kind of a grid of 16 electrodes. Now we have this circular arrangement of 60 electrodes, and it's going to be underneath that, um, that pattern that I just described. And then on the left side is this structure that's sitting on top of the well, and we call it a funnel, and that's actually how we get certain cells to land in certain parts of the device. So this is a good example of how sometimes to bring certain concept into reality, we have to do these kind of engineering tricks on the side to get things to work out. So, um, and you'll see a little bit more how that works in the, the upcoming video, but the bottom right corner shows the end result. In this case, we have cells, neurons that were dyed different colors, and after we put them onto the device using the funnel, um, a few days later, they're still staying put in their little neighborhoods. So here's the movie, and the first thing you see are, these are connections that help us actually make contact and record to the, uh, from the electrodes. There's the funnel going in, um, and pipettes putting the cells in. It's also called seeding the cells. And then all the little neurons going down the chute. And um, we take care of the cells and make sure they have the right nutrients, and then they, uh, they grow on the device. So there are happy little neurons in their respective sections. And we've been able to sustain, help the neurons to grow in the device for almost 100 days. And so what does it actually look like on our device? This is a, an image from a microscope. And you see the lighter splotches in the image are actually the neurons growing on and around the electrodes. And if we zoom in a little bit, here's an example of uh, some neurons closer to the electrodes. We see different clusters of neurons. And if we look closely, um, we see that these lines kind of extending out. Those are actually the axons that Heather talked about and that we kind of modeled with our student neuron. Um, and so what happens when we have a little community or crowd of neurons that are all connected to each other through their axons and they can, um, they can talk to each other back and forth? Well, here's an example of the recording that comes from the four electrodes, those four dark circles that we see. So each one has a, its own recording, and it's recording different um, action potentials from one or more neurons around it. And what we see is every few seconds, the neurons, there's a flurry of activity. The neurons start firing action potentials kind of together all around the same time, and then there's a little lull, and then it starts up again. So what emerges is this rhythm of activity uh, from the crowd of neurons itself. We call this bursts, bursting. So now we're going to have another demo um, to understand a little bit more about the different types of signals we can get from neurons and what it can tell us. So um, I'm going to have uh, ask for a couple of volunteers from our student crew. Got some props here. Okay. Hi guys. So what are your names? Misty, Haley. Hi. So Misty, um, you're going to be an electrode, and I'm going to have you put on this um, blindfold. Um, okay. And then Haley, you're going to be a neuron. So as a neuron, the way that you're going to create an action potential is to clap. Okay. And we're going to have um, what we represent as a stimulus. So in, uh, in our body, in our brain, a stimulus might be things we see or hear or pain. Um, here our stimuli are two pictures, either a race car representing something fast or a snail representing slow. So you're, um, Haley, you're going to respond to whatever stimulus you see in the following slides by either clapping quickly or clapping slowly. And then Misty is going to listen to your response as a neuron, 
And we're going to do this three times, Misty. And so you'll listen to the three examples. And then you're going to tell us what images actually showed up. Was it the race car or the snail for those three? Does that make sense? OK, are you ready? Number one. Number two. Number three. OK, very good. So Misty, what pictures popped up those three times? Uh, race car, snail, snail. Good job. OK, um, so Haley, you can stick around. But um, now we're going to get everybody involved. So now you all in the audience are also neurons. Um, so raise your hand if you're in the ninth grade. OK, that's a good group. So now our two stimuli are going to be either the words ninth grade or everyone. So you can guess what the instructions are going to be. If you see ninth grade, the ninth graders clap whatever speed you want. Um, and if you see the word everyone, everybody in the auditorium claps. So same thing. Misty's going to listen. And based on what she hears, um, she, she's going to tell us what the three stimuli were in order. OK, are you ready? OK, number one. Number two. Number three. Okay. Good job, everybody. So, what did you? What were the stimuli? Uh, everyone, ninth grade, everyone. That's right. Very good. Thank you, Misty and Haley. Okay. So, from that demo, we learned two things. First of all, we can get different types of signals, whether we're recording from a single neuron or from a whole group of neurons. And secondly, why do we even uh, record from the neurons in the first place? It's because depending on what we hear or what we record, we can uh, make an educated guess about what caused that signal in the first place or what stimulated it. OK, so now finally I'm going to hand it off to Monica. And she's going to tell you how we're going to take these different tissue models into the next dimension. Thank you, Sarah. So you heard from Sarah and from Heather before how we grow cells and we grow them directly on electrodes because what we're interested in is in their electrophysiology. I'm going to change gears a little bit and I'm going to add another dimension literally to those devices. And I'm going to do that using a technology called bioprinting. Now how many of you have heard of 3D printing? OK, it's quite good. This is a very tech savvy kind of audience. Um, so for those that aren't familiar with 3D printing, 3D printing is sort of a layer by layer approach, um, kind of like Jenga blocks, where you stack things up and you create 3D structures. So think about like a regular printer that prints out one sheet of paper. If you allow multiple papers to stack up, you cut something that's kind of 3D, a stack of paper, versus a sheet of paper, which is more 2D. And it's important that we do, um, and, or rather, why we're interested in doing 3D is because we exist as 3D. Unless you're Flat Stanley, which we're not, um, the rest of us are very 3D in nature. Um, and the technology is really great because it really allows us to bring engineering principles to biology. So we get to do the biology in a way that is automated, scalable, and with high precision. And so if we're going to make a tissue on a chip or an organ, we have to first gather up our ingredients. So our ingredients include cells scaffolds, which is just the material that the cells are in, and finally signals, which we call growth factors and proteins and basically the stuff that makes the cells um, happy and that gives them the cues to, to behave the way they do in the body. We then take all of these ingredients and we put them through the 3D print process. So in the 3D print process, we start off with making a design and we use some 3D, so or 3D, um, 3D drawing software. We then feed the design into the 3D printer, which then prints the cells in the, fig in the configuration that we um, designed. And so what exactly is it that I'm interested in printing? Well, I'm interested in printing the human vasculature because it's not just enough to build an organ that looks like an organ. It has to be able to have a functioning vasculature. Because if you don't put the functioning vasculature, it's like building a house without the plumbing. 
I mean, sure, you could probably live in the house without the plumbing for a little bit, but after some time, things are going to be not so great. And so it's the same thing with cells. If you put them in a 3D environment, but you don't put the plumbing in place, those cells are not going to live for very long. And it turns out that we are incredibly very well vascularized. Um, and the challenge is that the vasculature is really different in different parts of the body, and it's also uh, very different sizes. So the biggest blood vessel that you have is your aorta, which is about an inch. So think about the size of a quarter. The smallest blood vessels that you have are capillaries, and they tend to be about 10 microns. Now, Elizabeth mentioned that a, a single strand of hair is 100 microns. So imagine splitting that hair 10 ways. That's how big the smallest capillary in your body is. So some of you are thinking, wow, how do you print something that small that you could barely see? Well, I'll let you, let, I'll let you in on a little secret. I'm not doing it alone. I'm co-engineering with the cells. Because it turns out that the original engineers are your cells. They have been building organs in your body for many, many years. And they go off of these blueprints that are inside of them um, that we call DNA. And so what we want to do is we want to create a minimal architecture. So I want to create like the main artery and the main vein. But then I want to make sure that the bio ink, which I'll talk about a little bit in a little bit, um, that that bio ink allows the cells to form the networks that they're used to forming. So I have a quick video to show how this process works. So I use a 3D printer that initially lays down the bio ink and has the cells in a kind of random configuration. I then print tubes, and I'm printing these tubes because this is going to be how I feed the cells with media. And the media is simply kind of like um, Gatorade. It's got a bunch of proteins and sugars that the cells enjoy. And then I, I encase it all with uh, more bio ink that has the little cells. Now initially, the only place that the cells are getting fed is through those uh, tubes that we printed. So the cells in the middle, if they want to get fed, they've got to build networks that connects to the main, um, to the main tubes. So this is sort of analogous to like letting the, little, uh, letting the cells form their own little communities, their own little vasculature, and then I come in with the freeway and everybody gets connected. And so if you're thinking, wow, that looks hard, it is kind of hard. Um, and it's mainly hard because we have to be careful with the cells. So essentially the biggest challenge is keeping the cells happy. We have to keep the cells happy while they're waiting to get printed because these cells, um, need to be at certain conditions. They have to have the right temperature. Um, and also during the print process, we have to make sure that we don't uh, push too much stress on them. And so what becomes really important is the bio ink, because that's what they're sitting in and that's what they get extruded. So it's kind of what um, one of my colleagues likes to call a Goldilocks problem. The conditions have to be just right. So the bio ink can't be too liquidy, because as soon as it gets printed, it becomes a puddle. And it can't be too stiff, because then the cells are going to be unhappy. So imagine going down a water slide, which is a lot of fun if we're going down the water slide in water. But if I send you down that same water slide in cement, it's not so fun. You could get hurt. And it's exactly the same way with the cells. We don't want to hurt the cells, and we want to send them down in a bio ink that allows them to flow, allows them to form a structure, but doesn't um, put any unnecessary stress. So it turns out that the consistency that works well for my cells is sort of the consistency of snot. But am I printing with snot? No. I'm printing with blood clots. Um, and the reason I'm printing with blood clots is because this is a material that we have in our bodies and our cells understand and respond to it. So initially the cells are in, again, a random configuration. I'm not dictating any kind of structure. And they're in this material that is formed the same way that a blood clot forms. So if you've ever scraped your knee, you bleed for a little bit, but then eventually the, the bleeding stops, and that's because the blood clot forms. What happens next is you get a scab, and if you don't pick at it, eventually that scab falls off and you're left with new skin. And so this is great because printing with a blood clot allows for the cells to have a temporary home, and the cells know, hey, we're in a blood clot, we gotta fix this environment, and then they make that home their own home. And that's great because the cells, or rather the, the vessels, are different depending on what organ you're looking at. So the picture on the left shows endothelial cells, which again are the cells that form blood vessels. Um, and these, are, these endothelial cells come from umbilical cords. And so they form a very different structure. You can see that the structure looks kind of stringy, sort of like spaghetti. Now endothelial cells that come from the brain form also sort of this spaghetti-like structure, maybe not as dense, meaning not as many, um, but they also look like it has a couple of meatballs in there as well. 
So the point is that this bioink works well for different types of cells, but more importantly, it allows the cells to create the environment that they're used to, and, to, and it makes it look the way that it's supposed to be in nature. And this is pretty important because it's really challenging to try to recreate biology on a chip. And by using a method that allows the cells to do a little bit of the job themselves makes it easier on us. Um, and Chris mentioned before that the reason that we're doing all of this is because we want to be able to develop uh, maybe better medicines, detect better toxins, but also we're interested in the science itself. Because it's really hard to understand human physiology when it's locked up inside of us, right? So what organ on a chip and bioprinting allows us to do, it allows us to recreate the physiology outside the body. So we can take it apart and put it together, and we can do it outside the body. And in doing that, we learn things that we would never be able to learn if we only had the body that we had to look on from the outside and poke at it. And you know, um, this allows us to have more flexibility to do things. And it's a pretty exciting and challenging project, um, but it you know, can't be done by one type of scientist only. It requires a multidisciplinary team of biologists and engineers, toxicologists and chemists. Um, and some of them you met today, the four uh, incredible women that spoke before, and I'm going to bring them back out. But it's not just the four of us alone that work together on this project. We uh, have a whole other crew of people, and some of them are not even shown on this picture either. So we're a really big and uh, diverse team, and it's one of my favorite parts about working at the lab is that I get to work with uh, fabulous women like this and other really cool other uh, scientists and engineers as well. And so with that, I'd like to say thank you very much for being such a captivating audience.